I've just put a little bit about myself um, on the slide there, um, not because I'm looking for a job, but um, largely because I just wanted to show that I'm just your average orthopedic surgeon. I went through my run the mill um, specialist training, having seen a sum total of one necrotizing fasciitis in my training. And I joined Liverpool, and in my first year, how many do you think I would have seen? Um, if you put pyomyositis and necrotizing fasciitis together, I saw 13. And um, I looked around for guidance, looked for help, and I, saw, I, th I thought I'll find out whether we have a British uh, necrotizing fasciitis society to look for, for guidance. Of course, we don't. And I just had to do a lot of reading um, to, to, to find out how best to, to plan strategies for my patients. And that's all I'm sharing with you. I don't profess to be an expert on this. Uh, in fact, I'm still learning. So this is what we'll talk about today, the epidemiology, pathophysiology, and in particular, ways to diagnose necrotizing fasciitis early because it does make a huge amount of difference and, and, and treatment. So these are the conditions we'll be discussing. Uh, we all know these. Um, however, just look at the mortality rates for these. Now, in our orthopedic practice, I, I, I don't think there is anything that comes close. And anybody who's treated these conditions directly, you, you are hit by the sudden violence of it. When you finish debriding these, quite often I find myself with clenched fists while I'm doing my op note. It, you're, you're in a fight. And it evokes very basic responses in orthopedic surgeons, you know, fear, fright, flight, quite often, um, or, or, or fight. So it, it is, it is um, a problem that you will face, and it's, you know, if you're, on the, if you're on the show, you're the person dealing with it, it is, it is very important to have the strategy to be able to, to do the best for your patients at the time. So just go to the classification. Type one, uh, luckily, the commoner one uh, is polymicrobial. Uh, it's good because we have a little bit of lead time. These are more indolent infections. And it's bad because quite often the diagnosis is delayed. It, it, it appears like cellulitis. It's quite uh, late by the time you refer these patients. But still, if you look at the uh, more recent series, the mortality rates are closer to around 10% for these, and, and we can do better. Type two, on the other hand, is a completely different ballgame. Group A streptococcus, as, as you know, is a formidable adversary. It will not only undergo point mutations to, to go under the radar of your immunity, but it can also uh, uh, generate uh, superantigens, which um, uh, causes the immunity to completely go haywire and you get multi-organ failure from that. So quite high mortality rates from Group A streptococcus. Type 3, I have not yet seen this in my practice, but you can get this with uh, contact, with seawater, with open wounds, high mortality rates for these. And type 4 is um, slightly more common than we think. If you, if you have sent samples off for debridement and you actually find some fungus in there, uh, please make sure you treat it. I, I learned it the hard way uh, a few years ago. So if you look at the incidence of mortality of necrotizing fasciitis, it is nearly doubled in the last 10 years or so. And this is um, population adjusted figures, so this is a worrying trend. The rate of mortality is up by a factor of about 1.5. So nearly 13 to 14 per million population will get necrotizing fasciitis in, in the UK, males more common than females. And they will all have immunocompromise, nearly, but not, not everybody will have immunocompromise due to one of these um, uh, comorbidities. But why are these infections deadly? As you saw in the slide earlier, these are the same bugs that will cause sore throat and UTI and um, you know, cellulitis. What happens suddenly to make them such a deadly infection? The answer, of course, is, is multifactorial, but the key thing is the immune compromise and the response to the bug from the, from the body. So infection occurs, inoculation occurs, and suddenly there is permanent growth of these organisms, which means that they're able to, to form clumps, form, um, release angiothrombotic factors, and develop an area of uh, ischemia. And that basically means we cannot get antibiotics to it. The only way we can get rid of this is with surgical debridement. 
And unlike quite a lot of our other infections, which generally follow a more vertical method of spread with, with um, soft tissue surroundings uh, preventing spread, these go in a, in a horizontal method above the layer of the deep fascia. Um, very early on, the lymphatic channels are blocked as well, which means you know, so th there is no lymphatic spread of these. Ang angiotoxins and exotoxins will increase the virulence. One of the biggest problems why they're deadly is that we delay the diagnosis. It's not easy to diagnose these. They, they quite often look like cellulitis, and we are getting to, to these patients later than we should. And also, as I said earlier, we don't have a lot of experience in this. We don't see a lot of this during our training years. And even when we perform as surgeons, these cases will go to a multitude of specialties, plastic surgeons, urologists, uh, ENT surgeons, max max surgeons. So in, in total, our exposure to this condition is actually quite limited. So if you look at the pathogenesis here, a, a lot of the steps you will note, they are quite similar to what we normally find in sepsis, apart from the angiothrombosis. And that's one thing that rapidly changes a, a treatable infection, soft tissue infection, into something that requires a minimum of a surgical debridement to be able to control it. So you would see this quite often on your, on your uh, post-trauma post ward round. Is this cellulitis? It certainly looks like it. I, I know there's another of, uh, number of factors that will decide whether this is or not, but you wouldn't um, fault the uninitiated eye from saying, yeah, yeah, this looks like cellulitis, we should treat these with antibiotics. Um, this is what this person had. Uh, this was necrotizing fasciitis, and this is post debridement. So you can see how difficult it can be in the first instance to get these patients early and to get them into theater early. So before I talk about treatment, I'm, I'm gonna come to this and then work backwards. We've known for decades that early debridement for these patients saves lives. You know, if, if you're able to get your patients, this is not working at that, at that stage there, you have a very high chance of uh, managing to save your patients. The problem comes in the late diagnosis. So we've got to find ways of flagging up likely patients who have necrotizing fasciitis so we can act quickly. So how are we gonna do that? So these, to me, uh, are the most important features that separate necrotizing fasciitis from cellulitis. A lot of people with cellulitis have some hyperesthesia. They may have some pain, but these patients will have disproportionate pain, particularly tenderness around the area which appears to be obviously involved. And that is because there is angiothrombosis, there is ischemia going on uh, in that area, there is uh, hypoxia to the superficial nerves, and therefore they're irritable, and that's why they have this tenderness. Um, loss of skin turgor, it's quite common with this. Now, you, you get swollen, shiny skin with cellulitis, but quite often with uh, necrotizing fasciitis, you're starting to lose the turgor. The skin, instead of looking angry, is starting to look sorry and sad and, and dead. Um, crepitus is a thing that's quite often looked for. It's, it's very uncommon. In most studies, you'll find that it's present only up to about 20% of the time. So please don't look for crepitus, help it decide whether this is necrotizing fasciitis or not. And certainly don't do x-rays to find out gas in the soft tissues. Blistering and skin anesthesia occur later on. So if, if I saw this patient today, I'd have very little difficulty in diagnosing. You know, you can see some amount of duskiness around the, the lower aspect of the uh, necrotic area, and there'll be a lot of clinical features guiding me. But, but about four years ago, I wasn't that, that confident. And you're not confident because you know if you treat this as necrotizing fasciitis, you're going to inflict a lot of uh, uh, soft tissue damage on these patients after debridement, so you do think about this. But if you're not certain, uh, there is an opt-out. You can take these patients to the theater and perform exploratory incisions, which, if it's not necrotizing fasciitis, will show you that the, the, the fascia is fine, the subcutaneous tissue is fine and healthy and bleeding, and all you have to do is to, to suture them back. Uh, whereas if it is necrotizing fasciitis, you've probably saved a life. The LRINIC has been around for more than a decade. It's, an, it's a tool to try and differentiate between cellulitis and necrotizing fasciitis. It's quite a blunt tool. Uh, and you can easily see if you have a diabetic with cellulitis, because of their renal impairment and glucose impairment, they will very easily clock up eight on, on, on this scale. Equally, 
a liver disease patient with um, a child C failure, they will not have enough response to this infection to, 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 to come up to even six, but they will both have necrotizing fasciitis. Now, is this important? I still recommend the use of this because it's a very good test for the frontline medics to be able to flag up a really severe infection so that senior eyes can be put on the patient and you can decide uh, whether to go ahead with um, surgery or not. I don't think there is any role for doing CT scans uh, in diagnosis of these patients. They should be going to operating theaters, not to a scanner. There are signs that you can read that can be used to tell whether somebody has neck fascia or not, but they're not reliable. You will not have a reliable radiologist to be able to tell you, and I think it's a waste of time. So broad principles of treatment. Uh, we need broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, we, this is what we use in our unit, but it is very important that you have a discussion with the ID team or the microbiologist in your, in your center to agree on something that's going to be used and make sure that the medics, the A&E team, they all know about uh, that protocol. These patients, if they're not in shock when you see them, they are gonna go in shock in the, ne in the near future. So it's very important to involve other specialties, so anesthet anesthetic colleagues have to come and see these patients at the earliest. I think it's very important, including the, and also the ID team. There's forever been a de uh, debate about immunoglobulins for group A streptococcus and whether we should use hyperbaric oxygenation. Well, if you have uh, HBO in your unit, you can use it, but obviously you're not gonna send this to another unit for um, uh, oxygenation therapy. There is no definitive uh, evidence in the literature to say it helps. The mainstay of the treatment is aggressive, definitive surgical debridement at the first time. And I say definitive debridement because it's okay if you're dealing with the type one neck fash, but if you're dealing with a group A streptococcus, you can't be reactive in your management. You would have lost the, the, the game very early on. The only way you can win with a group A streptococcus is to, to, to be thorough and complete with the debridement. And I'll talk about that. So I use a, a zone-based approach for my debridements, and it's not, it's not my method. It's for, it was proposed by Wong um, in 2001. So the area of necrosis is a zone one, and you have an area which you believe is involved, and you mark that out as zone two. And zone three is a perceived uh, healthy tissue. So you go and excise the zone one first. That's the area where most of the bacterial load is. You then establish where your zone three is, and I use exploratory incisions to mark out where the healthy tissue is. You can also send samples from there. If you have a frozen section availability in your unit, then you can use that and help you immensely. But if not, you will still have had sent the samples very early on in your debridement. And you know, 10 hours down the line, I think you'll be grateful for that because you, you, you'll be looking to see whether something's growing in zone three or not. You then come back and debride zone two. And when I say debridement, it, 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 it means the complete excision of the fascia and all the superficial soft tissues included. Again, there's a bit of debate about the fascia. Some people do not excise the fascia. I've always found that when I send the samples of fascia away, there is indication that there is organisms in the fascia. And secondly, it's an avascular structure. So to leave something which is avascular with possible bugs in it, it, it doesn't appeal to me. So I would rather remove the fascia and have a healthy muscular layer underlying which is full of antibiotics because it's full of blood. <coughs> Repeat debridement, we should not try to use a usual orthopedic 48 hours uh, back and review please. Uh, these patients almost certainly would start to grow something in their samples by about 10 hours or so and you need to know whether your zone three is clear or not and you need to go back within 24 hours for the repeat debridement. Preferably by yourself. So, if you look at the patient again, so this is a 48-year-old lady who's um, had a knock on the, on the leg on a bedpost about 24 hours previous, and she woke up with a really painful leg. Now, you can see the duskiness around the, the, the necrotic area, and she had all the features I discussed earlier. She was exquisitely tender, distal to the, the, the purple patch that you can see on the leg. And all her, her LRENIC was eight, and this is what I do, so this is a zone one on the inner circle. You mark out your zone two. It is important to know um, what, what your zones are prior to debridement. Of course, I, 
I examine it again prior to, to starting surgery because it can sometimes move if you're, if you're dealing with group A streptococcus. So for this, for this patient, this was the appropriate debridement. It, as you can see, my zone two wasn't quite accurate. The, the involved zone was a lot more than that. But all the fascia is gone. She has healthy muscle uh, on the base. And you know, after six to seven days, this lady will be ready for um, uh, plastic surgical reconstruction. And, and you can see on, on the sides, there is areas where the, the, the zone three proposed incisions are made and they've been joined up afterwards. I get asked about the finger sweep test. It is, there's, there's no big beans about this. All you're trying to do is to separate out dead tissue um, uh, with your finger. So if, if, the fascia, if, if, if the fascia is dead, then it will peel off quite easily with your finger pressure. If it isn't, then it won't. And um, this is just gentle finger dissection. You'll also find dishwasher fluid when you do quite a few of these. It's, it's not present in all the patients, and it has really, it's talked about a lot, but it has no significance really. So how much debridement is adequate? Well, whatever is needed to reach healthy tissue with a, with a safe fire break. As I said, fascia should be excised. Return to OT within 20, 12, 24 hours. I don't use VAC dressings after my first debridement, uh, largely because usually it's, it's long debridement. You end up with various uh, going across joints with various folds, etc. And you know, the, if you apply a VAC dressing, it's liable to, to leak. Mm -hmm and they can lose quite a lot of fluid in the first 24 hours. These wounds are like burns wounds, and we, we tend not to use back dressings early on for those. So I don't, but it can be used. But I, I do use back dressings after, at the second look, because it just helps to control the wound care and um, lay the bed for plastic reconstruction. Amputations are uncommon with necrotizing fasciitis, but then it depends where the infection is. If it is near the digits, if it is appropriate, then you have to go out and do it. So this patient, for example, has a, a zone one, which is limited to dorsal on the foot. The zone two, I felt on clinical examination, was coming up to around mid-shin level. He's, he's um, uh, diabetic. And his debridement, appropriate correct debridement, was that much. I mean, it, during surgery, we could see that it kept going further and further up, and that tissue was not live, so it had to be removed. And, um, you know, of course, it requires slightly more challenging uh, reconstruction, but it, it can be done as long as you save the patient. So where should we go from, from where we are now? Uh, well, first of all, we actually don't know where we are. There's very little published literature from, from UK. Um, so I think we need to publish a little bit more in terms of what's our microbiology like, what our uh, survival figures like. We need to educate the frontline medics a lot more, so the A&E staff, the medical um, team who will be seeing these patients quite often. We need to develop fast track systems for referral in our units, so as soon as a patient with suspected neck fascia seen in A&E or the, or, or the AMAU, the ID team, the, the orthopedic team or, or the appropriate team should be fast tracked and um, uh, the patient should be taken up to theatre as soon as. So as I said, multidisciplinary approach is very important in treating these patients. We need to think about setting up a national surveillance unit. We need to know what we're dealing with, how good we are, so that when we apply some changes to our practice, we can tell that we've got better. There is some molecular research currently ongoing, but um, I wouldn't um, uh, look for a silver bullet cure in the near future from that. So learning points, I think th the more human factors are more important rather than anything pharmacological coming through to help us manage these patients. We need to set up systems which allow for early detection and, and rapid uh, 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 action that we can take following that. So definitive debridement as far as possible at the first time. Use of zone approach, I feel, I feel it's just useful to, to, in my practice, it helps to teach and also to, to document the areas that you're depriding. And if you're in doubt, use exploratory incisions. Now I don't have the time to talk about the, the rehab side of uh, these patients, but needless to say they are significantly scarred physically and mentally following these debridements. And there is a resource out there uh, which you can use. They have forums and you know, they're very helpful in setting up leaflets for your unit if you would like to, to contact um, Doreen at um, Leaf Spark Foundation. I'll leave you with this. Thank you. Thank you very much.